welcome to Point Blank Music School, where today we're joined by the one and only Claude Von Stroke uh, for this instalment in our live masterclass series. Uh, ex Point Blank student, owner of the world famous Dirty Bird label, world renowned DJ and producer of an array of dance floor anthems, the likes of Who's Afraid of Detroit, Deep Throat, and Monster Island. He's a true pioneer uh, of the underground sound we know today. So Claude's here to give us a bit of an insight into his work in the studio and some of the, the production techniques used on his tracks. Uh, we'll also be doing a Q&A at the end of the session, so make sure you get your questions in on the chat room. Um, and if you do want to learn a bit more about music production, uh, about what we do here, then make sure you head over to pointblankonline.net. And also, if you want to be in with a chance of winning a pair of these Pioneer HDJ headphones, then make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, so yeah, let's get into it, and without further ado, give it up for Claude Von Stroke. Thank you. Hi guys and girls, I'm Claude Von Stroke from San Francisco, the uh, Detroit suburbs, and I've never done this before, so we'll see what happens. I'm just going to go through a track that I made with Jaw from Dope, uh, the trio, he's the singer, and I never made a track with a vocalist before, so this was kind of scary territory for me. He just like came to my house and really didn't, there was no time to prepare. So I just went to what I know, which is Reason. I know Reason really well. I did my first two albums in Reason. And so like when I started, I had to mow lawns for like a year to get a, a sampler with 11 seconds of mono <laughs> for like $2,000. So now, because of that, I started in a very basic like way of chopping up stuff and like using uh, small samples and just keeping it very simple. And basically all that technology has done is made me make really simple stuff and like really overwork it and make it way more complex than it should be. <laughs> but that's, that's what I do. So basically when he came over, I was like, oh my God, there's a vocalist coming over. <laughs> and. Uh, so I just chucked in and started putting together a loop. So I made this in like five minutes. It's like just a Kong drum, super basic. And then my thing that I always do is kind of tune bass, bass lines. If you want to go in and look and reason, maybe I can just, I always use some kind of pitch on uh, the bass just to give it a little bit of that funky slide technique. I use that a lot in Bootsy Collins and Who's Afraid of Detroit and tracks like that. That's the cool thing about Reason, it's just like, it's really simple and fast. We are gonna end up in Ableton in a couple minutes. But uh, as you can see, this whole thing is pretty simple. That's just like a little shake sound. And this is another thing that I do a lot. Like I'll take one sound, like this little guitar sound, and then I'll copy it down three or four times and make like a whole different thing that I can EQ differently on every channel. I do that a lot with bass, like uh, in Who's Afraid of Detroit, for example, all the bass notes were on their own channel so that because they weren't resonating, because if you just make a bass line and you have the same EQ and same EQ, uh, compression on the bass, it's just going to act the same on the different pitches, but if you, may, if you separate everything out, you can EQ it exactly. I do the same thing on chimps, and you can make each note resonate correctly, and it's a big pain in the ass, but it really works. So that's basically all we did there. And then he came in and sang. This is going to take a second, but no. So basically what I did was I just took that loop once he had sang for about an hour, <laughs> giving me a million takes, and then I put it in Ableton and deconstructed. I just export them individually. So basically, I'm just saying that it doesn't matter what you're using to get your loops or what your source material, but it kind of does matter in the end, like what you're using, just you really need to know the, the mix down program, the final. Oh, we don't have a couple of plugins, but that's okay. So then you can see, hold on a sec. 
I've just put it back in. Uh, we're back to having no sound out of here. Okay. And I've added things in from other programs, but basically it's all just the same program, but just developed, you might say. And something I do a lot is like I'll put in like five kick drums, right? And, well, there's the whole track. I should have played you the whole track, sorry. <laughs> this is the actual track that came out in the end. You can hear it for a second. basic idea of the track. Uh, so I usually put in a bunch of different kicks and that's just so that in the end I can see what's going to work. So for example I had a few kicks in here but then in the end I saw that only uh, two of them were working together. Like I took out the sub main kick so I ended up with the main kick and the mid kick because the sub kick was messing with the bass line too much and that's there's no side chaining on this but normally I would side chain the kick into the bass but I was finding that the uh, the attack of the bass note needs, needed to really be on so I just figured out a way to have the kick be really sharp instead of having to side chain it so there's this like mid kick that's just really sharp and like a like a little ping pong ball and then a regular main kick that was from reason I think and that's all I ended up with even though I had a bunch of kicks in there and then another thing that I would do when I would come over from reason is I don't know if this is supposed to be done but I always double layer the bass because for some reason when you just raise the volume on the bass, it's not the same as if you double it and bring down the volume. I don't know why, it just, it just doesn't work the same. And then I would set them back, there's this little thing in Ableton on the right where you can control the milliseconds, which is also really cool that you can't really do in, re you might be able to do it, but I don't know. But you can kind of give it a little bit of swagger, like set sounds back milliseconds in the mix. I do that a lot, like hi-hats especially, it really works. Like see, this kick is actually set back minus two, and if that had been in, it would have been push forward seven milliseconds. And the whole kick's master is back uh, minus one, and that's probably because the bass is right on the one. And so the kick is coming in like a millisecond before the bass, so you, it's almost like a side chain trick. Uh, Sorry. So uh, the other thing with bass, I find these days especially, is that you have to make a top note. I don't know. Can anybody hear this? Yes. So it's very faint, and it's just octave up, and it's just all the. EQ, if you look at the EQ on the channel, all the bottom is cut out. And I usually put a spectrum analyzer that comes with Ableton so you can make sure that all the back end of that sound is cut. And that just sits on top and it makes the bass note, the tuning of the bass note come through. And it also makes it so that you can hear. It sounds like the bass note is coming through on laptop speakers 
is like super dubstep trick these days. You have to be able to hear the bass note on the laptop. It's all really basic stuff. Like there's nothing super amazing going on in this track. This is the clap from Reason. Just compression. There was a UAD thing there that is not going to work. The echo drums are here. The guitar is still here. And then other guitars. Reggae stab. So basically, I just took the reason and I'm using this as an arrangement program and kind of a fixing program, like to fix the mix up and do some other things that I would normally, normally be able to do. So then we get into the, the vocals, which was like something I'd never done. So this we did like 20 takes and the majority of the vocal stuff I found was just chopping. Chopping up the best takes and layering them together to give them a more thick sound. Ah, hold on, let me, I'm going to solo this group. In case anybody doesn't know about grouping in Ableton, it's basically when you take all these tracks below this track are vocals that I'm trying to keep in this same take and they're all grouped into this one channel so that on that one channel I can have all the same effects across the entire vocal. So what I did is I actually didn't do that much processing on the individual channels. I really did most of the processing on the main group channel just to keep every, and that really gives you a, like a tied in sound. So the majority of the work on this is just chopping it up. Jaw is a really funny guy, too. <laughs> he just came up with these lyrics and uh, he did the beat and it was going together. Uh, so you'll see there's going to be a little bit of uh, detuning, maybe. No. Your eyes are closed, but I can't see the sky. There's something wrong, man. It's just a sign. I've got some wings left for you to fly. <laughs> <Hold on. laughs> Sorry, I'm like lost in this view here. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so then on the second, I had a second uh, box channel. So that's the basic box. And then I made a separate, second group, which is somewhere around here. Sorry, guys. I just got to collapse this. I usually have my resolution like super tiny, so I'm a little lost. So this is a little bit more of like affected and a lot of de-essing, like if you hear this vocal had a lot of because I was really pushing it. And then the main trick of the track is in this, in these here, it's the ping pong delay. I actually learned this trick in one of the classes here. Uh, a lot of the effects in Ableton, if you right click, they have all these like little secret windows, like Re Reverb has this for high quality or low quality, and ping pong delay is the weirdest one. You can pick whether it's going to re-pitch the delay, fade, or jump, and if you do re-pitch, it'll give you milliseconds here on the bottom, and if you watch the milliseconds, it actually changes the pitch of the vocal, so we can I can show you that. So it's just going down a little bit, but it gives you that tape. It's like a tape delay. 
So the main... And there's kind of drums coming off for a second, you know, like every time I do that. Because otherwise, it's going to be like going out of time with the drums. But it doesn't matter. You, you, for some reason, you just keep get going with the, with the beat. So then I was going down and up and then raising the volume, lowering the volume. And then the main one is here. So you really get a cool effect. One thing that I should have done after I've played this a million times in the club is I should have put a utility on this. and monoed it a little bit because it, uh, most sound systems are not stereo. And I just should have cut it down a little bit because it's bouncing. And so when you make a really stereo sound in a, in a club track, usually you're gonna hear like, bye, bye, instead of bye, 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 you know what I mean? It's because most, they're like monoed out, most club systems. So don't make any, don't think you're doing something amazing and make some incredible stereo trick. Because it probably won't happen in the club. Ah, so then I was talking to my friend Tanner. This is the organ bit. And he was like, man, I'm just playing everything in when I make tracks now. And I just couldn't believe it. <laughs> so... I'm like, who does that anymore? <laughs> so I played this in, this whole organ bit. And then I, once I had it in, like, so then once I had it in, I started chopping it all up again. So this is like part of the main riff, but it's just like a note that goes to the whole bottom of the track. So that you're ready for the organ break when it comes in, which we're gonna hear in a second. But that sound is kind of building through the whole track. And then I just, I couldn't help it, but I had to go in and make a MIDI thing just for reinforcement and put some contact organs in there. But uh, here's the main, in the breakdown of this track, it goes into a whole organ bit here. That I originally played, and then on the second track, which I like to do a lot, is copy it and have a different EQ or something, but on this one, I octave it down one, and then I could never get it to sound the same, so I just kept it. It sounds a little bit crappy, but it worked. And then I, I wish I could get more screen on here, but you see there's like a ton of organ tracks, and they're all just doing something very tiny. They're just like, just giving it some meat, and make, I, I kind of wanted it to sound like church. When we get to the final break, And it's all like reverb tails and stuff like that to make it really all work together, but it's like eight takes. All that all that is organ. So it's a really basic track. But sometimes that's the best way to do it, I think. Uh, so then here, I really wanted it to, this is where normally we can talk about arranging a little bit now. In most of my tracks, I would do this section and this would like have some breakdown of some sort, but there'd be drums on probably. And this one was just kind of having a note and making it sound like 
and the reverb keeps growing and growing and then there's like ding, 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 other organs coming in and the echo is going up and up and up and so normally I would come back in almost every track I do I come back in with a different bass line for eight bars because it gives you this really interesting effect. It's the same idea but it's a different bass line and then you go back to the original and it's like oh okay but this one I didn't think it was necessary because all the sound is off for like 30 seconds and so it's just good to come back in and hammer it with the original idea. But I'd say for most house tracks, it's probably all of your elements that are not bass and not melody should be up front for at least a minute, probably a minute and a half, and if you can get away with it, two minutes before the bass kicks in. So you can hear every sound is in here that's not the bass. And at one minute, it's usually I drop it at one minute, but that's really not that long. And uh, it's just a good policy. I get a lot of demos with like 30 seconds of intro and 30 seconds of outro. And it's, I always, if I like it, I'm just like, just make, just tack on 30 seconds, please. Because <laughs> uh, when you're in the club, a minute is even short. Because you're gonna, you're just sitting there, and you're like, ah, oh, is this track even gonna work? And you're already 30 seconds in before you've decided if you're gonna play it or not. And then you're like, okay, I'm gonna bring it in. And so if there's only 30 seconds of intro, you're like, you might as well be DJing hip hop. You have to just cut it in, you know. I don't know. Is there any, are there any questions? I could probably go into more stuff about this, but yeah. Okay, so the other thing is uh, on this uh, vocal that's spinning out of, out of this world, I thought that uh, I would put the effects directly on the track because, God, there's too many tracks in this thing. This is what I always do. I make like a really easy track. It turned into like 50 tracks. But uh, so basically, there's a difference between the insert effects and the effects that go directly on the channel. On that vocal, I was putting the effect directly on the channel because the effect is so severe. But normally, on some of the little effects things, like little sounds that just go shh and transitions, uh, I would use an insert over here. So you see, I'd put uh, three effects over here. This is something I learned here as well. And, uh, and just automate them on the channel. So that means you can just put one reverb up here, one delay, like the things that you always know you're gonna use or distortion or whatever, probably not distortion, but, uh, and then you can automate them in the channels. And the other thing that gives you that is really impossible to do when you put it directly on the sound is that it lets this, the reverb wash out. I don't know how to explain that, but like if you turn on a reverb on the insert, it'll keep going. But if you turn on a reverb, even when you hit the next beat, you turned it off, but the reverb is still washing. But if the effect is on the channel and you have to turn it off, you basically have to draw the line and it turns off and it sounds really unnatural. So you've got a reverb and then it's like kick, next kick drum. But if it's on the insert, it's like reverb, still going from the last note, this kick drum is dry. So that's like a really useful tool to keep transitions going and making things sound smooth. And that's another thing that I'm big on is transition sounds, just little tiny sounds that, uh, hold on a second, I'll find it. Like flare is what I call it. Does anybody see office space? Uh, just little sounds. that you can't hear because the volume's so low. Can you hear that back there or no? It's very faint. <laughs> All right, let me find a different one. That's the only one I have in this song. I'll just turn it up. 
they're just re like this is probably just a snare from the track that's recorded and then reversed. So it's like, and then you reverse it, and so that you can get from section to section if there's a really dramatic change in the track that you want to get away with, but you don't know how you're going to get away with it and have it sound right. You just like reverse the sound, a main sound in your track, and put it right, butt it right up against the next kick drum for the for the changeover, and it gives you a really smooth sounding transition to the next part. I don't know what else to say about that. <laughs> I do have another thing to talk about, though, if, if I need to talk more. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we've got a couple of questions, actually, um, from the guys in the chat room. Um, one is about the, the kind of mixing and mastering process. Yeah. Um, do you do oh, that good. yourself? I do, you, do you do kind of the Yeah, mixing unfortunately, mixing? I do that myself, and it's a big pain in the ass. It's the part that drives me the craziest, the mix down, because I'm a kind of person that mixes it down while I'm making it, and so I waste tons of time and get hung up on the mix down during the making of the track, which is a huge pain. But I think it works in the end, because you're basically making the track to play. So one thing I always do that's really not recommended is I always mix it as loud as I can. <laughs> But I've always done it, and it works, and I just can't, I don't know how to get out of it. <laughs> like I, everybody tells me not to do it. But in Ableton, you can't go on the reds too, too far. It's a disaster. It just turns it into a pancake. So I've been learning tricks about how to make it loud without, like, I won't turn in a file that's like this, and I won't turn in a file that's like this, but it will be just like a little bit of, it's not going to be like super nice for the mastering engineer. Because I already know what it's supposed to sound like and I'll play it and I can get it really close and it just needs a little bit of sugar on top usually. And I just find that sending like a really low file to mastering is just like, you might have to start over, you don't know. You don't know what you're going to get back. And if it sounds Unless good. the guy's a genius. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we've got another question from uh, but Will. But that's not uh, what you're supposed to do. Don't do that. And <laughs> uh, we've got another question from Wilgo, who's asked, "How much time does it take usually for you to complete a track?" It really depends. Sometimes it takes me like six months, and sometimes it takes like four days. But it never takes one day. There's people making tracks in one day. That's not me. Um, another one. Um, from uh, Davey Fitz, who's asked, what do you use to create your sub bass? Uh, it's usually some version of an 808 drum. There was a sound that I used in Reason for years called BD Boomer. <laughs> you put in just the NN19. Uh, yeah, it's usually just some kind of 808, some... I use different ones all the time. And I'm usually sliding them around a little bit. And usually adding like what I showed you with the high note, but on that's not usually what I don't usually just octave it up. I usually take the same bass, copy it, cut out all the bottom and put a really like disturbing distortion, but keep the volume really low. So it's just kind of buzzing on the top and that really works. Like just to get a little bit of buzz, not like but it just gives it a little bit of the uh, sheen and it also lets you hear the note on several different sound systems and can give you the pitch a little better. Because a lot of times when you listen to really subby music on like car stereo or something, you don't hear any of it. So it's nice to have a little extra thing like up in the top range is that's that following. Is that something you bear in mind, you know, different sound systems? You know, you are making music for the club, but do you think about people listening to it on their laptop, on their iPhone? I usually play it in the car to decide if it's going to work. Right. Yeah. And I'll play it on the laptop, but I don't really care what it sounds like. <laughs> in the, la the laptop is, like, disturbingly bad. But, uh, yeah, I always play it in the car. If it works in the car, it's usually going to work. It's a banger. It well, it's just, like, if everything sounds right in the car, 
you usually listen to a lot of music in the car. So for some reason, you know what the car sounds like. You know what I mean? I probably listen to more music in the car than I do in the studio. So I know what the car sounds like better than my monitors. Well, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> How about uh, any of you guys here? Has anybody got any questions for Claude? Um, why don't you just do everything on Ableton now? Now that I mean, uh, you, you, I you, do. Oh, you do do everything no, on Ableton now. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I but sometimes you, I do. Oh, you do, yeah, because you, there's you, just something. I'm just faster in reason, and it's just because that's what I learned. Okay. I mean, if it's like uh, I learned what's I don't even remember what it was called the opcode program or whatever from way back when. I was really fast at that, but I eventually got over it. <laughs> but I mean, I can, if there's something about reason, the limitation is an advantage for me because I come from a very, where it used to be really limited and you had to just figure it out. And so I like that about it. So it's, it's almost like I have too many plugins. So you use it more like a sketchbook. Yeah, it's Put your ideas definite. down and then yeah. get intricate and enable them. Yeah. Fair enough. Absolutely. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Um, are you mainly predominantly use the plugs in, plugins within Ableton now, or do you have a lot of other plugins sort of from outside of Ableton? Yeah, I do have a lot of plugins, but I couldn't get them to work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, it's sounds all right though. Commercial though, I guess. <laughs> if I start naming all the plugins that I like. Oh uh, yeah. I, the question was is like, you know, now that you're fully fledged Ableton and pioneer sort of, um, do, do you predominantly stay within Ableton or? Do you no. I'll throw in anything that works. Uh, one of the coolest plugins that just came out is this Fab Filter Saturn, which basically takes what I was just talking about the whole process of doubling the bass and you can like make you can take the distortion it's a distortion and you can keep the sub completely clean divide it and put a little bit of distortion here in the middle make another division put like a super crazy distortion here make another division make the top really fizzy it's like a multi-band distortion unit it's so you can literally make bass in five minutes yeah Awesome. It's pretty cool. I like that plugin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I use lots of stuff, but I, I never know what I'm doing. I just put it on there and move the knobs around just like everybody else and see what happens. <laughs> Even though I take classes, I never remember what anything means. <laughs> The, the ping pong delay repitch thing was good. That, yeah, that was cool, right? I didn't see that. I learned that in class here and then I used it right in the track. Yeah, it's cool. And you could probably get that from a tape delay plugin, but it's cool that you can just do it right in reason. Yeah, it's wicked. I mean, Ableton. <laughs> <laughs> Ableton's going to be mad. In terms of that, I was going to ask, in the studio, are you obviously you come from the days when you're using like a hardware sampler. Do you yeah. use any hardware now? Do you still have yeah, the studio? Yeah, I use a Moog, okay. Voyager, Moog, Voyager, whatever. I, uh, yeah, I use like a Roland keyboard for just uh, getting, like I played the, all that organ stuff on a Roland. I use that just to get like all the bread and butter stuff that I don't want to look for. Sometimes it's nice to just have a keyboard that just has a lot of sounds in it. Mm. So you don't have to hunt down through like 300 sample packs, like a banjo picking or whatever. So yeah, I do it all the time. And I play it, I have a little uh, patch bay thing that's kind of cool. It's all run through this thing called uh, Liaison by Dangerous Music. So it's actually a patch bay, but it's all hardwired in the back. So I can just press a button instead of patching it, and I can just go through like the delay or the distortion unit or whatever. I have a bunch of little outboard stuff. So I usually use that stuff going in, and not I don't bring it back out and go in that much. And we've got a couple more from the guys online. Um, Okay, it's quite a good one. Uh, what do you look for in, in demo tracks and what makes them kind of stand out for you? 
Yeah, I don't know. I, it's like, it's hard to explain. I like things that sound original and different, but still will work in the club. And it has to be some element of funk going on, or I'm not really going to be into it, I think. And I actually do care about how it's produced. Some people don't. They'll, they say, oh, we liked it so much, we'll go get, go, go get somebody to mix it down for you. Okay. I was just having that conversation yesterday. But I don't know. I just think that that's not like a good long-term artist. So you like to, you I like like to, to hear think something of, with a sound. Yeah, and I like to think of when I sign a track that maybe we're going to do like five EPs with this person. So I'm always thinking about that kind of thing. Mm. Not such. Not do what? Not Molly yeah, I want. Yeah, right. I don't want to have to do it. Like fix it. <laughs> I always get in that trap of like, oh, if I just fix this one little thing. But I stop doing that. It's too painful. Um, we've got one from Presuming Ed, which I think we've kind of covered already. Um, he's asked, which native Ableton plugins do you use on the regular? I use reverb. I use the delay. I use the utility, like on everything. Uh, EQ8. I use. I use. Is he talking about effects or instruments? I think he's talking about effects. I use tons of drum racks and that kind of stuff. Let's look at the effects for a second. Sometimes I use amp, but I've started really using other distortions a lot. I use auto filter a lot. That's a really good plugin. It sounds totally different than the EQ. It's just a little bit. It's more sweepy, like more liquid when you move it around. I never use auto pan. I use compressor for side chaining because it's the easiest one. There, it's like I don't even know how to side chain with a third party compressor yeah. in Ableton. It seems impossible. Um, okay, we've got another one from Matthew White who's asked How do you go about EQing your bass lines? Yeah, I mean, I kind of went over that a little bit. Just make one subby, make one just hitting on the top a little bit, and I usually double the one that's subby. And sometimes I'll even EQ that differently. Like, these are slightly different EQs, very slight. But one of them has the saturator and one of them doesn't, so... And they're at different volumes. I just mess around until... I like it, which is what everyone should do. Okay. <laughs> um, another one from Anthony Duvan, who's asked, do you use any pitch drop techniques in real time when you're making your tracks? I don't even know what that means. But <laughs> 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 I mean, <laughs> I mean, uh, I use like transpose, yes. Like making a clip, I'll make a clip and then and drop the transposition sometimes, but... I asked him to clarify that one, actually, because I, I think he meant I heard. I, I, I said, do you mean when he's DJing? He said, something you do on the fly, not pre-programmed into a clip. Uh, Is it where you click the record button and you have um, the certain, uh, certain controllers mapped to stuff and you just fiddle around while the, trip, uh, the clip's playing? I never do that. But I like that idea of playing around with stuff and just recording it and then just taking the best takes. <laughs> I think that's a cool way to make music. I, I don't usually do it. It's wicked to do when you like map the reverbs and stuff and then yeah. just play the track and then you just... Yeah, that's a good idea. Stuff. And then you can mess around with yeah. it. And then you I might have tried audition. that on something a long time ago, but I forgot all about it. But I did play this in... And that's, I guess, I probably did like 10 takes and then I chopped it all up. But I didn't do any pitch dropping. <laughs> uh, we got any more from in the room? Any more questions? No? Okay. I have another thing that I can show if you yeah, want. If, if you're up for it, go It's ahead. a little bit crazy, but it's Sounds not. Sounds good. A, it's a more, t this is pretty simple, but hold on, this is falling out. This one I do need to look because it's bananas. So I learned this online somewhere. Which courses did you do online? Oh, I took uh, dubstep and hip hop 
and mixing. They're all really good. A dubstep was the best. Let's see. Okay, so we were just having this conversation before this started about how uh, when I started, you used to be able, you used to write a sequence, right? And then you would be in hardware. Is this not gonna play? Please play. Okay, this is like super generic sequence, right? So in hardware, back in the day, you could write the sequence and then go in here and you'd have your kick, your deep kick or whatever, and you'd see that here. Oh, I just freaking lost it. Where'd the macros go? Oh, unbelievable. Yeah, okay, hold on, I'll get there. Nope. Anyway. I'll find another track. <laughs> Does anybody know how to get back to those macros that I was just on? <laughs> what the? Sorry. This is not a fully developed concept yet. I just started doing it. But hold on a second. Why don't I just do it and then I'll show it to you. How about that? Basically, the concept is, sorry, <laughs> yes, the concept is that you can change the sounds in real time while you're going instead of like having to look for sounds. So you have to have a sampler. Sorry, I'm just using, used to having this giant window and it's very tiny. All right, you set up a sampler and then you set up a drum rack. Somewhere over here. Your goal is to put everything in the drum rack in the end, but you have to make the device first, which is a big pain. Hopefully that will change someday soon. So then you get all your favorite samples. Okay, perfect. So let's say I want to do like hi-hats or something. And I want to have all my favorite hi-hats on the same machine so that I can just go and choose between the hi-hats. I drop them all, I have to select them all up to like 126, we'll just take like 50 or whatever. You drag them all in here, 49 samples, right? And then you go to the zone feature, and then you go to the select feature, and then you have to go in this window and right click and distribute the ranges equally. So basically now you have it. Set up so they're going to drop on each different uh, thing once you make a macro. Yeah. Wait a minute. <laughs> Hold on. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So then you have to save this device. We'll call it snares or whatever. Was it hi hats? And it's going to copy them all in there, which is kind of going to take up some space, but it'll still work. And that should be in your sampler folder now. And then you go into the drum rack, which is not that drum rack. And you put your hi-hats device. And now you should be able to go back to this thing. And map, and map it to macro one. Now you have a sample selector. And so now you can create a MIDI track. Oh, fuck, sorry. <laughs> MIDI clip. 
I just started doing this, but it's cool. And type something in. And then you can just cycle through the samples like this. We'll go through all 49 samples while it's playing. Let's, you can't really hear it, it's not very loud. Hold on a second, there you go. Right. So then, while you're making your track, you can do this on kicks, bass lines, anything. You can put it in, and then once you have it all in, you just start switching out the kicks over here. And the only limitation to this, the main problem is there's only eight macros. So you can only do it for eight uh, drum rack pads, but you could just make another one. You just keep making them and making them. And then once you get this all like, I have a whole kicks machine that I just finished, which is just like eight different, it's like subs, ethnic, hard, blah, blah, blah. And then you can just go through and make a track. And like what I was talking about before, when you're running the kick against the bass, it's a much easier thing to just be able to run through 126 kicks against the bass line. And you, in like two seconds, you're going to have the right one as opposed to going to the left to this browser window for like two hours and dragging them in or hot swapping until it works. It's just more like a real-time way of working, and I totally suck at making it, but <laughs> because I just learned how to do it. <laughs> but uh, I think it's a really cool way of working, and just imagine if you put a whole, whole bunch of like random weirdo effects in there and just started cycling through and like had effects going. It could be really creative. I'm really excited about this way of working. I think we're going to do some stuff with this, but I just wanted to show it. Okay, cool. I've actually got Even a though it's really clunky. <laughs> There's a couple more questions uh, for the guys online. One from Darren Vella, who's asked, when you hit a brick wall in a studio, if you ever get stuck with something, um, what do you do to, to work around the problem? Yeah, I just, uh, I actually just try to power through. You do? Yeah. You don't step away from the track? No. No. It's a mistake, but... I think uh, that's actually when all when everything is failing is when like something really random happens, yeah. and you just get like this mistake. And oftentimes that's when you throw away the whole thing. But sometimes that's what you have to do. Mm -hmm. Like you just come up with a completely different idea. And almost every good track that I ever did is just like a failure track that turned into a good track. <laughs> <laughs> just by keeping on just hammering away we've got uh, another quite interesting one actually from uh, Chase Bigwood who's asked um, where your name comes from yeah that was just a, it's just a joke <laughs> from <laughs> we were just goofing around a long time ago making up minimal techno DJ names <laughs> and <laughs> the most cliche <laughs> techno name and uh, for some reason this one just people started calling me it. And then uh, the girl's house where we were making up the fake names, her birthday party was the next week and she made, and I was DJing at it, but it's like for like 10 people, like not really. But she decided to be funny and made a flyer and said Nicole's birthday featuring Claude Von Stroke. And then, I, and then I made a track and I was like, everybody likes this name. So I'm just gonna put this track, on, uh, name on the track. And that was it. So now I'm Claude Von Stroke forever. <laughs> yeah, in America, it's actually f totally everyone gets it right away, but over here, it just sounds like a real name. <laughs> right. It's obviously a joke where I'm from, but not here. Uh, we've got another one um, from a name I can't read out, actually. It's a little bit expletive. Uh, but he's asked um, where you usually start when you start making a track. Where do you start from? I'm always uh, starting with the main bass and drums. Like, 
I almost never start with the melody part. Yeah, never. I can't even think of one time that I did. It's always like the groove. You got to get the groove. Justin Martin is even more finicky about this. He won't do it until like the dr everything is super chunky and then he'll start working out the track. Uh, but I, I kind of do a little bit more EQing on the, on, the fl on the road, but I will wait till there's a groove before I flush it out. I usually try to make eight bars that I like and then arrange it. And then it's usually like, if you can get eight awesome bars, you can make a track in like a day once you get to that eight bars that you are great do you normally have like um a set idea about what you want from a track when you come to make it sometimes but sometimes sometimes that really kills you mm. it like hangs you up forever because you are like oh i gotta make a track that sounds like this and then you just end up don't you don't make anything because you're you're trying to make some kind of new thing and to just sit down and make whatever comes out, I think. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we've got one from um, Shab Roughcut, great name, uh, who's asked if you ever use commercial sample libraries in your tracks. Sometimes, but just like uh, the sound, like the drum sounds. Mm. I never use the loops. Mm. I usually don't sample in general. Like almost the only song that song that I did with Eats Everything has a small sample, sample in it, but usually I don't sample. Except for, I mean, everything is a sample, yeah. right? So I sample, but <laughs> I don't like take like disco songs and filter yeah. them out and, or whatever, hip hop lyrics. I usually just do it myself. I like to use the mic a lot. Is that you on Who's Afraid of Detroit? Yeah, it's me on every song. It's actually my wife, though, that's the singing, the little singing bits, like, on top. Um, we've got another one from A. Wicks, who's asked, if you have any tricks for adding warmth and, and thickness um, to elements in your tracks. Just, uh, I think it's important to make sure you're layering. Like, try to, if you have a kick drum, maybe put a little top sound on it and even try just throwing in a little hiss sometimes that works or just crackle on tracks that sometimes it makes it sound good or just some kind of ambient sound over the top and even it could even be pulsing with the rhythm you could side chain it they could side chain like a day in the park with your kick drum and it might really be like cool give it some some vibe um, another one from Derek, who has asked, uh, I think a question that a lot of people want to know, uh, how, what's the best way to get a demo to you? <laughs> uh, we have a SoundCloud link right on the website, and I listen to every single demo. Not for seven minutes, but <laughs> <laughs> I do listen to them all. Um, uh, oh, and another one um, from, I think it's the same guy from Derek, who's asked, um, which production of yours is your favorite, or what, what's the one you've worked the hardest on, in your opinion? That's a totally different, yeah, two, different, two different tracks. <laughs> I don't know, I, don't, I can't say, it's impossible. I really like, when I play it out, I really like the War Paint remix, for some reason that always really, that just came out right for me, and I like, the Black Star. I like a couple of remixes. I like Who's Afraid of Detroit. There's some tracks that I like a lot. Like, I don't really play Whistler that much, but I thought it was cool when I made it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, is there any more, any more from the audience in here? No? Yeah, go for it. Um, your Who's Afraid of Detroit was such a massive record for you. And obviously it was massive in the minimal techno scene. And your sound now is completely different. Well, not completely, but why didn't you stick to that sound and get right into it? And, or, wh or why did you change it a bit more? Well, I didn't really change it. I mean, I had the Andy track is slightly similar. And yeah. there's, I just don't want to just make a bunch of tracks that sound the same. It's not really interesting. But, I mean, I'm always, who knows what's going to come out next. I know what you mean. 
like maybe I should have wrote it a little longer. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? It's not really fun to just make a bunch of stuff that sounds the same. I don't think. Okay, cool. Well, I think we'll, we'll probably wrap it up about there. Okay. Um, just enough time to say a massive thank you to, to Claude. Uh, let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. It could have been smoother, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, thank you to Claude for, for showing us all how it's done. And uh, just enough time to say if you do want to find out a bit more about Point Blank, then head to pointblankonline.net or pointblanklondon.com. Um, and again, if you want to be in my chance of winning those headphones, make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel. And that's it from us, so we'll see you very, very soon. Thanks for watching. At Point Blank Online, you've got two methods of interaction with your tutor. Firstly, you've got the weekly online masterclass, which is in real time. And then also we've got feedback on your assignments, and that's known as DVR. So the online masterclass is a one hour session you get with your tutor every week. You can ask questions about the lesson content and get instant feedback and also demonstrations on the fly from their computer desktop with our streaming technology. DVR stands for Direct Video Response and the concept is really simple. You upload your Ableton Logic or Cubase project file to your tutor, he downloads it and then pushes record on the screen capturing software and evaluates your work, so basically giving you one-to-one -one feedback. You see all of the mouse movements and any parameter changes made by your tutor. It's kind of like sitting in the studio over their shoulder watching what they're doing whilst they work. We have found the DVR process has truly revolutionized the way that we teach online and the results speak for themselves. Book your place on the course now by visiting pointblankonline.net.